we are overwhelmed at your goodness. Just that line from that song, your goodness is following after me. Lord, it has always been your intention to bless us. It has always been your intention to, to justify us, to prepare us to live in eternity with you. And during this time, Father, before we with you permanently, while we're on this planet, you've given us the tools. Lord, through salvation, through water baptism, through being filled with the Spirit, through your word, through prayer, through community, through the commission, you've given us the tools to live victorious lives. And we pray now that your word would challenge the status quo in our lives and that we'd have a, a greater testimony and a greater understanding of your word to be able to speak to this world and give it hope. We want to celebrate the gospel so that through us, others may be impacted. I, I lift up every single person today in this auditorium and those across all the sites, Father, that because of your word, because of the ministry of the Spirit, we'd be a stronger people, Lord. We'd be better prepared uh, to be used as instruments in the kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Anyway, we're going to carry on with Acts and we're going to look at two very interesting people today. Aeneas and Dorcas. We're going to carry on with Peter's ministry in Judea and we're going to pick it up. If you have your Bible, it's also going to come up on the screen. Um, Acts chapter 9, verses 32 to 43. So this, the kind of overall theme as we're looking at the book of Acts is we, we're following with what Jesus said, I will build my church. And so kind of the disciples as they walked with him could see what he was doing and then he commissioned them to do that. And now in the book of Acts, we actually see it worked out. And so these kind of three testimonies are there to challenge us that this is how you build the church. It's interesting. Uh, you know, over the years that we've led and kind of inter interacted with others and been exposed to teaching on how to grow your church, very few teach this. Very few teach, read the book of Acts and trust God to do that. Because surely if God did that then, as he established his kingdom, he wants to do it today. Um, Spurgeon said, if you give a carnival to get people into church, you've got to give them a carnival every Sunday. And you know what? The book of Acts is kind of very certain about this, that the word of God increased and grew in power, and that caused the revivals that we see. And the fact that today we're going to read through the word and allow the word to challenge us, and we have these discipling courses, and, and, and we kind of focused and obsessed with the Word of God, for me, is the sign of revival in the church of God. And I want to encourage you to, to not let it just be these moments where you get excited about God's Word, that study it yourself, get stuck into it, and allow God to raise that water level of the Word of God in your own life, because guaranteed, it's going to produce fruit. And it'll be fruit season by season. I can see times in my life when I kind of just take it for granted and, you know, forget about the reading of the word. Boy, do I invite trouble. And it's not read the word, no trouble. No, read the word and you are victorious because you understand the will of God in the circumstances that you go through. So we've got some great narrative here. Now, as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise up, make your bed. And immediately he rose, and all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died. And when they had washed her and they had laid her in an upper room, since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, 
weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside. Jesus did the same. And he knelt down and prayed and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up and he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon of of Tanner. Awesome, awesome. Two people impacted. Look at the results. Um, In Lydda, it says, all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. One miracle and the whole town turned to the Lord because of what they'd seen. And then in um, Joppa, it says, and it became known throughout all Joppa and many believed in the Lord. So there's kind of patterns we see in Scripture. Um, We see it in the life of Jesus where he went about doing good. It says in Acts chapter 10 that Jesus, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So there's kind of a biblical way in which God has ordained it that the gospel goes out. You see, when the gospel goes out, it goes out with fruit. Something's going to happen. Something's changed. You know the greatest miracle is the transformation of the heart. But God is also going to use signs and wonders so that through that, many will come to know him. And through that testimony, they'll be impacted as well. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, it says, He went throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction amongst the people. So three ways, and we looked at it already, is that Jesus taught, Jesus preached, and Jesus demonstrated. Demonstrated. And so we see here the gospel takes root and impacts exactly in the same way. And so kind of for me, if Jesus said, I'll build my church, It's not just about a good philosophy or a way of life. There's a demonstration of God's power. How did I come to know Jesus? Through the power of God leading me. Through the power of God transforming my life. You know yourself that there's not an ability in you or in me to make any kind of change. You know the kind of life you led. And there's some great testimonies. You know, Paul says of himself that he's the greatest sinner. Actually, you know what? I know me. I'm the greatest sinner. Actually, I know some of you. And you're probably the greatest sinner. That's just how it is. But what can change us is the power of God. And so God has reserved signs, wonders, and miracles, an outpouring of the Spirit for the gospel to go out. This is how he commissions the disciples in Mark chapter 16. I was up at 3.30 this morning with jet lag. The weather was nice outside. Thank you, in case you want to know. But for some reason, I'm thirsty as anything. In Mark 16, it says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel of the whole, of the, to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. This is the seriousness of the gospel. But here we go, verse 17. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they'll cast out demons, speak in new tongues. They'll pick up servants, servants, serpents in their hands, and they will drink any deadly poison. It will not hurt them, and they'll lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So Jesus says, I'm going to build my church. He shows the disciples, and then he commissions the disciples. And we know from Mark chapter 16, verse 20, they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. So the challenge is for us to understand the way in which God is building his church. So Jesus did it. Jesus showed the disciples. Jesus commanded the disciples. The disciples go and do it, and we see it recorded in the book of Acts. And it's not once. 
Uh, we've just looked at the whole story of Philip. Philip goes to Samaria. He preaches there. There's amazing signs and wonders. And it's like that whole town believes. And then they fill to the Spirit. The church is established. And so, for me, you cannot divorce the miraculous power of God from the gospel. And the miraculous power of God is not a circus act to try and kind of attract people by how good you are. It's a sign to accompany the gospel, to open the door for the gospel, and to show folk that this is the heart of God, as He wants to heal, He wants to impact, He wants to draw people to Himself. He wants to break down those barriers of disbelief. It's not just trying to convince people, it's letting them see the power of God, letting them understand the power of God. And I tell you, my testimony, my, the good points in my life is God's demonstration of His power through leading me, through healing me, kind of, uh, kind of was in the whole drug thing, and it kind of took me two days to come out of addiction because of the Lord, the healing power of God, just kind of being transformed from Him. And it doesn't happen to everyone, but I've got my testimony of how the gospel impacted and I was able to share the testimony so that others might believe as well. And so how does Jesus build his church? With demonstrations of power and his word going out like that. And so we trust in God for that to be restored. Like I said right at the beginning, we've got a city that is not going to be convinced with argument or, you know, kind of debate. It's going to be convinced with a demonstration of God's power. He wants to pour out his spirit. You see, the healings of Aeneas and Dorcas pointed to Jesus, pointed to him so that we can have faith in him, to understand that he's interested in and he loves people and he wants to get involved in lives. You know, you think of the personal nature of both of those. You know, these were two, you know, like, it doesn't sound like they were prominent people, especially Dorcas. She was like sewed and made tunics and the rest of it. But Christ is interested in our community. And you know what? It's through us. Here it was now through Peter that he impacted. And through us, he wants to impact many, many lives. And so signs and wonders open the way for the gospel. And they confirm its preaching and build up faith in Jesus. So let's look at the healing of Aeneas. Um, eight years he's sick, he's bedridden, it seems like there's no hope. Remember Peter in Acts chapter 3, him and uh, John were on their way to pr pray and they see this man at the gate, beautiful. And I'm sure that went through Peter's mind. I know God can do this. And you know what? That miracle caused 5,000 people to be born again. That miracle got him into trouble because he got taken before the Sanhedrin and they questioned him. And guess what? He had another opportunity to share the gospel <laughs> to a very kind of like otherwise audience. Uh, but yet he had the opportunity to share the gospel. So miracles give us the opportunity to do this. And that's why I think Peter led of the Spirit, knew what God was capable of doing, and he reached out to this man and he was raised up. I love it. Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise up and make your bed. Jesus is the center. Jesus is the hero of the story. Jesus is the focus. It's not about me and my healing ministry. As I want you to understand today the thing that Jesus is doing in your life. And of course, it says that he became a testimony where he went. People could see him and they were impacted. This was the guy that was bedridden for eight years. Now look at him. Look at what Christ has done in his life. And that whole town comes to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. What about Dorcas? She's an interesting character. Tabitha, Dorcas. Luke describes her as full of good work, works and charity. It's amazing. Eh? Full of, I wonder how they would describe me in a verse of scripture. Have you ever thought of that? There's a terrible thing in 3 John about a guy named Diotrephes, and it summarizes him this way. He loved to be first, and he didn't show hospitality to the saints. Interesting. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, there's two guys, Phygelus and Hermogenes. It says they deserted Paul. 
Because here we have a great testimony. I think that's an awesome testimony. I tell you, we have many of those. And I do believe, and we need to see many, many more with this kind of attitude. She became ill, she died, and then as it was custom, they prepared her for burial. And then Peter was introduced. And notice what he does as he puts the mourners out, because now he's going to focus on what is important. Gets down on his knees. In other words, my appeal is to heaven. He's just healed somebody who was bedridden for eight years. Surely it's, you know, I've got the power. No, he understands the power is from heaven. So he gets down and he starts to pray. And he asks God, submitting himself to the authority and the power of God. And then he spoke to the dead body. For me, exercising godly authority. That's quite a thing, that. But he had a word, obviously, in his heart. This was a moment that God had created for the gospel, for the kingdom, for Lydda, for that whole, I mean, Joppa, for that whole area. He was going to show them his power. And then, of course, she's raised up, and many believe. I love it. I love these examples of, of God getting involved in lives. And you know what? He's got us to be like Peter with the same commissioning to build his church. You see, church is not just about sitting and receiving and enjoying and celebrating and being full. It's about looking for opportunities as well. Dorcas reminds us of that. You know, it's interesting. The, the Bible, it says, was written as the spirit moved individuals. So really speaking, the Spirit of God used individuals to tell a story. So we see a narrative, but the details for me are spirit emphasized. You know, why even mention Dorcas? Because I tell you, every single person is important in Scripture. Every single person. And I tell you, it, it kind of for me uh, highlights the fact that it's not just about the loud mouth ministries. Not just about the Peters and the Pauls. It's about Dorcas as well, a quieter ministry. 1 Corinthians 12 says, you know, too often we, we put emphasis on the eye or, you know, the, the more visible gifts. But I tell you, Dorcas is there in the background and she's serving the body of Christ, serving the community in a wonderful way. We need every gift. You know, you think of Moses on the mountain and they fight in the Amalekites and Joshua's in the valley. And, you know, when Moses lifts up his hand, Joshua wins. And when Moses drops his hands, Joshua loses the battle. And so very soon Aaron and her realize this. And in a service kind of supporting ministry, they come alongside him and lift up his arms and hold them up. And the battle is won. And it says... At the end of that passage, it says that the banner, the victory in Israel was God. You know, around those campfires that night, you can hear Joshua saying, I won the battle. You know, I stabbed and I cut and I, you know, there's so many people. It was me. I'm the general. And Moses saying, no, it was me because, you know, I lifted up my hands and the battle was won. And it was right. Joshua was right. Moses was right. And of course, Aaron and her were saying, unless we held up Moses' arms, the battle wouldn't have been won. And they write as well. You see, we need every gift operating for God to win and for the battle to kind of come out victorious. Every gift. And I love the Spirit's emphasis on Dorcas and, and on the, the very normal and ordinary role, but yet the impact that she had. She had a testimony in that town. They loved her. She was there behind the scenes doing these things. By the way, I wouldn't want Aaron or her's ministry. In those days, they never had underarm. And you lift up some guy's hands the whole day. I, I tell you, it. and often it's these ministries that are not kind of front and foremost. I tell you, those are the ones for me that make a difference. About maybe 20 years ago, we went through a season of kind of, you know, God encouraging us, you know, being this uh, 
a ship, this battleship, and how we were in the roaring 40s, and every hand on deck was important, it was a prophetic word. Who remembers that season? We preached through Isaiah, the 40 chapters, the chapters 40 to 49. And, and in sailing, and especially when you're going through, you know, like the roaring 40s, especially in the season we're in, we need every gift operating, every person using their grace deposit. We read in 1 Peter, it's quite interesting, chapter 4. It's like uh, maybe Dorcas taught him this. And it's in verse 10. It says, each, as each has received a gift, and that word gift, it's grace. It's each of us have been given a deposit of grace. Every single one, not one has not been given. Use it to serve one another. Isn't that lovely? Serve one another. So, in the context of the body of Christ and in the community, we've been given gifts to serve. As good stewards of God's varied grace, whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So as I serve with my gift, guess what happens? God is glorified. That's why, you know, for me, the one transformation in my heart is we don't have volunteers in the church who stand and greet or make coffee or do children's ministry. You know what? We all have been given opportunity through what God is doing here to serve God and to use our gift to bring glory to God. That's not volunteering. You know, for me, it's like minimizing the gift, minimizing the person. You're just a volunteer. No, you're not. All of us are important and every gift is important. This is kind of for me a summary of what Dorcas teaches us. So don't forget, lesson number one, this is how Jesus builds the church. It's the proclamation of the gospel and the demonstration of the gospel in power. Stir up our faith to do exactly the same. Stir up your faith to, to pray for those who are sick. Stir up your faith to trust God as you're interceding for people for opportunities to go and do this. And I tell you, your ears should prick as soon as you hear that there's a need like this. Because I want to be there to comfort the sick. I want to be there to, to kind of help those who are in need. I want to be there to minister the grace of God. And in a very similar way, practically, this is Dorcas. This is what she teaches us. Use the gifts or the talents or the resources you have been given to serve others. Do you want to make Christianity interesting? You know, oftentimes it's like, oh, Christianity is like so boring and lukewarm and the rest. You know why? Because I think we forgot how to give and how to serve. When you serve others, it's like the, the, the very glory of God descends. The, the joy of God is there. Because the, the, the brilliance and the excitement of Christianity is not just in what I've received, it's that God has anointed me and given me talents, gifts, and resources to help others. I tell you, kingdom is not about closed hands. Kingdom is not about stinginess. Kingdom is not about you were all called to serve me. It's, Lord, how can I get involved? She was full of good works and acts of charity. Full of this. Full of that. And, and so, Lord, how can I serve? Just, I think it was about a week ago, on Friday, whatever it was, there's a new door that's opened for Love Joburg, and the call was, we need sandwiches. And i tell you what was interesting is to see how quickly that call was answered, and they had more sandwiches than, than were necessary. And you know what? Every one of those acts of service, like with Dorcas, goes towards showing who Christ is, and the net result is we all share in what is going on as the kingdom moves forward. Every gift important. And so we don't look down on any gift. Making a sandwich is just as important as preaching the gospel. It really is. Second thing about her, stay faithful in doing good to others. You know, the whole of Christianity in Matthew, you see it, you know, we ought to love God, and it's we ought, we ought to learn to prefer one another in love. We, we need to learn this. 
And, and you know, for me, being faithful to, uh, and doing good to others is the very heart of God. You know, Dorcas made clothing for the poor. There's probably other ways in which she helped as well, probably inspired many others. And it's often people like Dorcas become catalysts in a community until eventually kind of that heart is celebrated by many. You know, it's, it's, you can see that children's ministry. We've got a couple there that are just on fire for what God is doing. But go and see around them. There's just so many others who are using their gift. So when I use mine and I serve others, I inspire them to use theirs so we can all celebrate what God is doing. So there's a part for each of us to play. So into relationships in ways that will have a lasting impact. So, you know the usual complaint. I'm so lonely. Nobody loves me. Nobody invites me to their house. I never have coffee with anybody. Yes, I tell you that. Eventually, you, you kind of get yourself into a miff tree. And, you know, you're the saddest person on the planet. Do you want to know that it's not about how many people invited you? It's how many of you invited and you know what, you invite them without thinking reciprocation. Don't keep score. You know, I'm never going to invite them again because they never invited me when I invited them. And we went all out. No, it's not about that. Man, I want to I wanna be a fresh spring. I want to be a, a resource to others. I want to open my life in that way. And I don't serve to get, I serve to practice the nature of God. Imagine if Jesus was like that with us. Well, I'm sorry, I've given enough to you now. I need to see some return on my interest. And so heaven shut for you today or for forever. All of us would be in a deficit. But let's make relationships a priority. Make service and ministry towards other, others important. It's vital. You see, we want to move from being self-centered to making sure that we live our lives out that way, in the body of Christ and outside the body of Christ. It's looking for opportunities to show love. You see, it's the last point about Dorcas, is let God use you to be a witness to others. I wonder how many people, when she got the, I don't know how to make a tunic, by the way, but she must have kind of put a bit of cloth on people and, you know, marked it out and cut. And while she was doing that, they said to her, why are you doing this? You see, often those acts of service give us an opportunity. Often the, the love that we show and the interest that we show gives us an opportunity to speak to people. And now, of course, she had a great testimony. You know what? And God raised me from the dead. <laughs> I'm sure you couldn't shut her up. But let God use you to witness to others. And you, and you know what? Start with your testimony. Start with what has already taken place. Start with your revelation of who Christ is. Start there and, and start to show the love of God. And, and as we show that and as we open our hearts of compassion that way, God's going to create opportunities for us. Uh, and it's, it's awesome. That for me is where the whole big apostolic vision, be, you know, begins. You know, often you hear, you know, we can invite an apostolic gift into the church. We're an apostolic church, commissioned to go. That's an apostolic church. You know where it begins? It's me opening my heart and loving and caring and serving. And it's easy because we've all got something to give. Let's bow our heads for a moment and let's trust God. The love of God is real, and the love of God is for every single one of us. Thank you, Father, for so clearly in your word showing us how you build the church and helping us understand the importance of every gift in the body of Christ.